wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of commodities. The individual commodity appears as its elementary form. Marx's investigation into capitalism begins with the examination of the commodity, useful products of human labour that are bought and sold every day, and analysing the contradictory nature that is embodied within each commodity. Marx here is working in the abstract form. To follow along, it might be worth imagining that you're in space or complete blackness where absolutely nothing exists. No items, no money, no people, just the commodities I'll mention in our examples. Let us take an apple as our commodity. It has a use value or a value in its use because it satisfies human wants of some sort or another. I can eat it when I'm hungry. It's refreshing, I enjoy the taste or the smell, etc. It also has an exchange value. I can exchange it for something else. It has value in exchange. However, these two different values are contradictory to each other. A commodity only becomes a use value when it's actually used or consumed, when I actually eat it because I'm hungry. It only becomes an exchange value if it's not used by me, but instead exchanged. Yet the commodity itself is the embodiment and unity of these two contradictory elements, a relationship where the opposites only find their meaning within each other and are so linked together. In looking at the idea of exchange itself, we also find again it forms a contradiction. If we wish to exchange something, it's because we want something different, a different use value. However, because neither person in the commodity exchange want something of lesser worth than their own product, then we also want something that is somehow at least equal to whatever it is we're exchanging. An exchange for something the same, but different. But what is this worth, this value that we seem to desire? Let us take two commodities, e.g. corn and iron. The proportions in which they are exchangeable, whatever those proportions may be, can always be represented by an equation in which a given quantity of corn is equated to some quantity of iron, e.g. one quarter of corn equals x weight of iron. What does this equation tell us? It tells us that in two different things, in one quarter of corn and x weight of iron, there exists in equal quantities something common to both. The two things must therefore be equal to a third, which in itself is neither the one nor the other. Each of them, so far as it is an exchange value, must therefore be reducible to this third. Marx now begins to examine the exchange value by placing commodities in relation to different commodities of trade and their exchange values. Let us, for an example, take a football and a hat. How do we determine the exchange value between these two commodities? Does one have more value than the other, or are they equal? Is the use of kicking something equal or greater than the use of putting something on your head? This distinction seems somewhat arbitrary and subjective. Use values wildly vary from every one of the infinite amount of commodities available. So how can they be compared in relation to one another and considered equal for exchange? Now how about a football in exchange for five hats? It would seem obvious here that a greater quantity of commodities hold a greater exchange value. But what about a football in relation to the exchange of five peas? Here it seems obvious that the reverse is now true. The football still holds a greater value for us despite there being a greater quantity of peas. So it would seem that the quantity also becomes an arbitrary distinction in finding a value relation. So how do we measure this unseen underlying equivalence that each commodity seems to share that we call value? If then we leave out of consideration the use value of commodities, they have only one common property left that of being products of labour. But even the product of labour itself has undergone a change in our hands. How about the labour that produces it? Let's take for an example some corn and some coal in relation to each other. Both require real and physical labour to be produced, and Marx categorises this aspect of labour as concrete useful labour. However, this concrete labour process of producing corn and producing coal again are vastly different from each other. And with an infinite amount of commodities in the world and an infinite amount of different concrete labour processes happening to produce these commodities, 
it again becomes impossible to compare and equalize the processes of concrete labor. What's the measurable equivalence between digging a hole and cutting down rows of plants? The only common property here between them then is that they're all products of labor. Not any particular concrete labor process or any form of productive labor, but are altogether reduced to the same kind of labor, human labor in the abstract. They are merely congealed quantities of homogeneous human labor, crystals of this social substance which is common to them all. To all the different varieties of values in use, there corresponds as many different kinds of useful labor, classified according to the order, genus, species, and variety to which they belong in the social division of labor. The division of labor is a necessary condition for the production of commodities, but it does not follow, conversely, that the production of commodities is a necessary condition for the division of labor. Humans perform many, many different kinds of useful labor, producing all kinds of things and services. Marx discusses at length the different observable examples of useful labor in the textile factories of his time. People weaving linen thread into linen cloth, or the different useful labor of tailoring, cutting and sewing the linen cloth into linen coats. The real world examples are countless, from planting carrots to writing code, mining for coal, crafting wood into furniture, etc, etc. Humans discovered many types of useful labor early on, long, long before capitalism. And there's always been a social division of labor, where some people perform some kinds of useful labor and other people perform others. Marx states that human labor mediates the metabolism between man and nature. However, Marx argues that it's only within capitalism that these diverse amounts of use values produced by diverse forms of useful labor have taken the form of commodities as things sold to others. He returns to this argument in much more detail in a later chapter. Just as therefore in viewing the coat and linen as values, we abstract from their different use values. So it is with the labor represented by those values. We disregard the difference between its useful forms, weaving and tailoring. As the use values, coat and linen, are combinations of special productive activities with cloth and yarn, while the values, coat and linen, are on the other hand mere homogeneous congelations of undifferentiated labor. So the labor embodied in these latter values does not count by virtue of its productive relation to cloth and yarn, but only as being expenditure of human labor power. In the previous section, Marx introduced the concept of abstract labor, labor that is abstracted from its diverse forms of useful labor, defined as the simple expenditure of human labor power, simple labor power and simple average labor, performable by every ordinary person. And it's this abstract labor that gives value to a commodity. But how is this amount of abstract labor measured? Some people might think that if the value of a commodity is determined by the quantity of labor spent on it, the more idle and unskillful the laborer, the more valuable would his commodity be, because more time would be required in its production. The labor, however, that forms the substance of value is homogeneous human labor, expenditure of one uniform labor power, the total labor power of society which is embodied in the sum total of the values of all commodities produced by that society. It counts here as one homogeneous mass of human labor power, composed though it may be of innumerable individual units. Each of these units is the same as any other, so far as it has the character of the average labor power of society and takes effect as such. That is, so far as it requires for producing a commodity. No more time than is needed on average, no more than is socially necessary. The labor time socially necessary is that required to produce an article under the normal conditions of production and with the average degree of skill and intensity prevalent at the time. Again, first we must take into consideration that for Marx's argument, he is dealing with a perfectly functioning capitalist system and he is assuming that all notions of labor processes 
are being performed at a constant intensity and speed. Marx argues that the amount of labour and the equivalent measurement of value embodied within a commodity are determined by the time of labour, regardless of complexity or skill. Not the concrete useful labour time required to produce a given commodity in a given production setting, but the average amount of time of abstract labour governed by society that is required to produce it. He refers to this as socially necessary labour time. So, two commodities that are produced with the same amount of socially necessary labour time have the same value as each other. If the total amount of time for abstract labour in a given society to produce one football is also the same amount of time to produce one hat or even one pea, their values are all equal. On the one hand, all labour is, speaking physiologically, an expenditure of human labour power and in its character of identical abstract human labour, it creates and forms the values of commodities. On the other hand, all labour is the expenditure of human labour power in a special form and with a definite aim. And in this, its character of concrete useful labour, it produces use values. Useful labour determines actual production. Abstract labour and its socially necessary time determines the value of the labour embodied within the commodity. Marx also points out the distinction between simple labour and complex or skilled labour, but argues that more complex labour counts only as intensified or rather multiplied simple labour, so that a smaller quantity of complex labour is considered equal to a larger quantity of simple labour. Marx briefly turns his attention here to productivity. If we imagine useful labour's production process for a moment, and where to measure it by its productivity, or its output of commodities per hour. Now if, for example, we introduce some new machine that reduced the amount of time to produce that commodity by half, doubling labour's productivity, we will have cut the value of each commodity in half also. Marx will return to this argument again in greater length throughout the book. 